you for. John chapter 7. John chapter 7. Continue our study in the book of John, verse 40 is where we're going to take it up. But once again, let's just pray that the Lord would minister his word to our hearts because it's his job. Um, nothing that I give you is worth anything, but what he gives you is worth everything. So Lord, we just come before you. It's your word. Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts the word of God. Change us. Make us more like you. Help us, Lord, to remember to apply what you give us into our lives. And not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. So here we are, Lord. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, we've been looking at Jesus speaking about, you know, he's the water of life. He is the light. In uh, Isaiah 12, verse 3, it says, Therefore you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And we just left Jesus off in the middle of their celebration when they did, you know, they did, did their reenactment. I'm not going to talk about it again because I shared it last week. But the reenactment of, of their holiday, so like you do, the Garifuna holiday, you know, you reenact, reenact it. That's what they, they were doing. And in the middle of it, after, you know, the, uh, the high priest had poured out the water, representing the, the, the water that was given to them in the desert out of the rock, Jesus stands up when it's silent. He says, if anybody's thirsty, come to me. I'll give you water. You, you, you know, and he's talked about that water and not having to drink again. If any man thirsts, take a drink of this. During the silence, he stood up and said that. Because it was a picture of him that they were reenacting. And he stands up. He's basically saying, here I am. Drink from this cup. In a river of water. Not just being satisfied, but being filled. You know, I think it says there in verse 39. No, no, verse 38. He says, he who believes in me, as the scriptures said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So it's water that will flow out of you. You know, the spirit hadn't come yet. We look at that in verse 39 where it says, but this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believe in him were to receive for the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And we know that when Jesus was glorified and he was he ascended and the Holy Spirit came down here and inhabited us, God himself by the Holy Spirit, he inhabited us. No, I don't, I don't particularly, well, I don't like it at all when people speak of the Holy Spirit as an it, because the Holy Spirit is he. He, God, the Spirit. Not some force. Let the force be with you. No. That force has no power compared to the power of the Holy Spirit in our God. So what the people are acting out here at, at, at the temple, Jesus is saying that he is the fulfillment of that. Now, that brings us down to verse 40. John 7, verse 40. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David, from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. You know, they, they didn't have the full facts. They didn't do the right research. They would base their decision on what they assumed. Have you ever done that? Yes. What they assumed. Base your decision on facts. Base your decision on the word of God. They did not know that he was born in Bethlehem. Exactly what they were talking about. They didn't know that his father was God himself. They didn't know that. So they were, you know, assuming these things and saying, oh, he can't be this, he can't be that, or he's this, or he's that. And then it continues on in verse 44. And some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief, chief priests and Pharisees and said to, them, said to them, Why did you not bring him? Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. 
<clears throat> That's because he spoke with authority. He spoke with boldness. He knew what he was talking about. I mean, he was God himself, God in the flesh, God as a man. So they, they never heard anything, anything in, in their life like that before. And then verse 47, the Pharisees then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? You know, have you given your life? Are you becoming one of them? You know, he's asking, they're asking that. And no one of the rulers of the Pharisees has believed him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, that's in chapter 3, if you remember, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? And they answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. And everyone went to his home. Nicodemus comes to the rescue of Jesus. I mean, he had that great uh, meeting with Jesus where he learned about being born again. He must be born again to enter the kingdom of God and not of water, but of the spirit. Being born again. When you give your life to Jesus and you confess him as Lord and you trust with his whole, your whole heart that he shed his blood on the cross and he rose from the dead. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside you. You are born again. Your spirit is born again. That, that's what that is. I know some people have been afraid of that term through the years. But that's it's very simple. Your spirit is dead. needs to come back to life. And you invite Jesus in your heart. comes back to life. Simple. And so what do they do? They attack him. You know, an ancient debate trick was, if you cannot answer the argument, attack the speaker. <laughs> kind of works that way again still today, doesn't it? See, in this chapter, people respond to Jesus in the wrong ways. They, they really do. His half-brothers responded to him in unbelief. Various people responded, you know, responded to him with debate. If they had just received the truth. If they just would have believed and acted in obedience, they would have been at the feet of the Messiah confessing their sin. They would have been set free from their sin. But you know, people today do the same thing. Just willingly reject Jesus as their Lord and Savior. When they know down deep in their heart that it's the truth. I believe Every person, when you share the gospel with them, they know it's the truth. The Holy Spirit reveals that to them. They know it down deep. They just ignore it or don't want anything to do with it. Same, same as, they're not any different than that. We look at that and we go, oh, look at those people. You know, we're the same. Well, chapter 8. We're going to look at the first 11 verses of chapter 8 this morning. classic scripture that most of us know, always know, but listen, listen, let's read it. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was, where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. So the beginning of this chapter starts off with the Jews trying to stone a sinful woman. And it's going to end with the same group of people who want to stone a sinless Messiah. They want to stone a, a sinful woman 
and they want to stone a sinless Messiah. There's this poem I got years ago. It's a small little poem, but I, I think we can relate to this. It says, I wish there was some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, where all of our mistakes and all of our heartaches and all of our sickening sin. It could be dropped on the floor like an old shabby coat and never put on anymore. You know, I think that poem that we've all felt that way at some time in our life. That we just wanted to start all over again. The heartache of our sin, all my sin, we just, we just forget about it. Things in our life that we are ashamed of, we are embarrassed of, just to start again. And I think we've all felt that way. I, I would imagine. I mean, I've felt that way. I mean, at time, why did I do that? How could I have done that? Look what I did. Things that we've done that nobody else knows about. Only us. Just to forget about it. Well, you know what? There's good news. There's such a place. And in, here in John chapter 8, we, it's pictured for us. For you see, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Maybe she was even brought naked in front of Jesus and dropped down naked. And it wasn't about the woman. They were trying to trap Jesus. They were just using her. And if, if he said yes, that the woman should be stoned, then the people would turn on him in the message of his grace and mercy. Because what kind of love is that? What kind of grace and mercy is that? You know, it was obvious the leaders were out for justice. Otherwise, they would have brought the man also. It wouldn't have just been the woman. It would have been the man and the woman. And if Jesus... He said, stone her. He would jeopardize that position as the friend of sinners. And if he said not to stone her, then the law would have been broken. And he would be a lawbreaker. They had him. They had him. And can you see him there? <laughs> gotcha, buddy. You know how we do when we gloat? And I always make sure I don't gloat. That woman of mine keeps me in line, I'll tell you. You know, it's probably unlikely that this, that this, they caught this couple in the act of adultery. It, the, probably, probably the man was involved in the setup, and that's why he's not there. And because the law required, the law required, that both parties be stoned. Leviticus 20, verse 10, and Deuteronomy 20, 22. Not just the woman. So where is the man? So he, gets, he was probably, good possibility, part of setting this up. Now, in those days, if someone was caught in adultery and they were not married, they would be brought to the center of the town where they, had, they built this square wooden box. Uh, and in the box, they would put about three feet of cow manure, cow poop, about three feet of it. And then the guilty person would stand in the box of the cow manure and a cloth was wrapped around his neck and one person would get on one side and one person would get on the other side and they would strangle him or her and then put his face down in the cow manure. That's how they would die. Now, they were buried there right on that spot and a tree was planted on, on that person so that when young kids came by they could say hey man sexual immorality don't go there you end up as a tree so you know it was, it was, it was very a very serious offense adultery doesn't seem to be very, be very serious nowadays does it sexual immorality and adultery now if the parties were caught and they were married they didn't get strangled, they got stoned to death. It was death either way. Pretty serious. And they, they're supposed to have more than one witnesses, at least two witnesses. And you know, in, in, in this scene here, those Jewish leaders were very, very rude because Jesus was in the middle of teaching. And they just break right in on them. Just rude. I mean, they could have waited. 
But you know, they just, they were, they wanted to get him. They were very, very rude. And so in there, verse six, we see, what does he do? He stoops down and with his finger, he writes something. No, we all want to know what it is, don't we? I mean, everybody, everybody I know wants to get to heaven and say, what did you write? People have a lot of different ideas. Centuries earlier, remember, the finger of God wrote on the tablets, the Ten Commandments. That's interesting. And then in verse 7, he says there, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then in verse 8, he stooped down and wrote again. And the first ones that leave are the old guys. Then the younger guys. Maybe what he wrote, you know, I mean, you, you can think about it. Maybe he wrote another name. Here's the old rabbi sitting there and he writes down Susie. You know, or Jill. You know, I don't know. Maybe he wrote down a place. Me and you down there. Or a date. Or who knows? But whatever it was, when he said that and he wrote, they what left one by one. Oh, I forgot about that one. Oh yeah. I walked off. You know Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And now, now ladies, you know, we, it goes for that way for you too. It's not just picking on us, right? But listen to that. But I say to you that everyone who has looked at a woman with lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It, it's, it, it starts right here. Sin starts right here. Thinking about it. Oh, I, how I know. I, I'm, I've shared with some of you before in, in the past how, you know, I, God delivered me from drugs and, and, and alcohol, marijuana and everything. And, and I had not had any anything for like six months. So I really, really first started walking with the Lord and and then I went in my workshop and I pulled up this rod with a jeweler and I had all kinds of precious stones and rocks and stuff. And so I picked up this rock and there was a, a, you know, part of a joint left, you know, the roach was left, which we called them, but part of a joint, marijuana cigarette, right? And I looked at it and I said, what was that like? I literally, my brain said, I wonder what that was like. Before you know it, I smoked it. Like, that was no fun, I'll tell you. People think they get high. I didn't I get high, man. That was miserable, man. I mean, God just said, okay, that's what you want. He just let Satan have me. Man, I just, I mean, every person I offended in my life, I think I heard about that day. Every, you know, oh, that was great. Oh, Lord, man, I, I, wanna, I don't want this. I, I want to be normal again, you know, and I put on praise music, got the Bible, and read it, man, God just let me suffer there in my stupidity and my sin. And it was miserable. And then the next time, a few weeks later or something, I happened to move another rock and there was another one, you know what, that baby went on the ground and went like that, it was gone. I said, uh-uh, I'm not doing that again. That, that's Joseph fleeing instead of, well, I, you know, instead of trying to talk to Potiphar's wife, he didn't sit there and go, let's talk this out. He split, man. There was no talking. The flesh is weak. It's just a lesson for us. Get out of there. Because it starts in your mind. When those thoughts come in your mind, you know, what I, I tell the young guys here, and I've told them for years, and when I would, would really speak with the youth a lot here, I tell those young guys, I said, you can't help the first look. It's when you look back. That they, if, if that guy with a six pack comes by, you know, like me, <laughs> what are you guys laughing at there? Good, that, good thing Miss Anna's on here, she'd be rolling on the floor, right? <laughs> that girl goes by in that thong bikini. Turn. 
Don't stare. Don't do, take the second look. It's the second look. Because you can't help the first one, you know. You, you can't go through life like this. <laughs> so, you know. And that's, it's not just with, you know, sexual immorality, but any type of sin or temptation in your life. Just don't, don't let it sit in your mind. Lord, I, I turn, you know, it says, take every thought captive to Jesus. Lord, this is yours. I'm giving it to you right now. I'm sitting at the foot of the cross. I'm going to praise you. Whatever it takes, get your mind away from that. Do it. You'll be much better off. Guaranteed. But what Jesus is saying here, Matthew says, all are guilty. Every one of us is guilty of that, okay? So instead of passing judgment <clears throat> like they were trying to do here with this woman, Jesus is passing judgment on those leaders there, isn't he? Somehow, they walked away. And the only one who had the right to cast a stone, the only one who could stone her because there was no fault in him, didn't. That was Jesus. He could have done it, righteously cast that stone at her. And also, I do want to share this. In no way is Jesus showing that he is going easy on sin. Hey, Jesus is going to forgive me, so what? You know what? The heck, why not? Go for it. No. He's not going easy. He's not contradicting the law. Because for him, he was going to forgive that sin on the cross. Serious. Forgiveness is free, but guess what? It's not cheap. It cost him his life. His blood shed on that cross. The beating he took before that. The humiliation. Forgiveness is free, but it costs a lot. That, that's why it's, it's so important that we, we don't take it lightly when we blow it. And, and try not to blow it again. Because he takes every one of our sins. It's, it, every, he, takes, he takes every one of our sins individually. It, it, it's something that happened in eternity, so there's no time there. So, I, you know, my opinion on this and what I kind of feel is that every time I've sinned, it's just like driving that stake, that nail in his hand, you know. He's taking that sin upon himself. Every one, individually, every time I do it. And that, and that keeps me, helps keep me in line, okay. Now notice something else here, you know, in, the, in this story. The first thing is this. Look how sinners treat sinners. They treat sinners like they're not sinners. Like, you know, well, like they're perfect or something. Now they treat this woman. They come here and throw her down like that. And they're just as guilty. Brutally condemning her. It sometimes it seems like that we come down on those who have the same sin that we do. I've heard that say about pastors. They just harp on one thing. It's probably because they're dealing with it in their life. It, it, you know, somebody gets stuck in one area. It, it's like maybe they're dealing with that. If we don't understand grace, people that don't understand grace, they seem to sniff sin out. They seem to find it in others when they don't understand grace. Grace. Getting what you don't deserve. Mercy. Not getting what you do deserve. And they don't understand that. Maybe people are irritated because maybe they want to do that sin and they feel like they can't or something. You know, I, I don't know. The second thing that we see here is the law condemns sinners. The law is good, but it also points out our sin. The Ten Commandments show us our sin and that we have a need for a Savior. I think it's, uh, oh, what's that guy? I forgot the guy's name. You guys remember the guy's name? That always gives the Ten Commandments out. His organization, the one that, that put all the Ten Commandments all over the country here. Oh, I forgot his name. But, you know, he would, he, he does not need, need ideas on, you know, how to reach people by just sitting with them and saying, hey, if, you know, have you ever, you know, talked about the Ten Commandments? Well, have you ever lied? Well, well yeah. What's it make you? A liar. And he just goes down the line here to point out to them, to show them, hey, you need you need a savior because you you've broken the law. 
And thirdly here, Jesus does not condemn her. The Pharisees, the leaders try to, the law does, but Jesus doesn't. He has compassion and forgiveness for her. He sets her free not to sin again. For those of us who are in Christ, Jesus is our Savior, you know what? We have the same grace and mercy given to us. We are set free not to sin any longer. We don't have to anymore. Jesus set us free. He's given us the victory. Romans 8, 1, there, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you are in Christ and dead to the law, in Romans it says. You are in Christ and dead to the law. Wow. You are forgiven. You can walk out of here this morning like that woman walked away, rejoicing that her sin was forgiven. Rejoicing that she wasn't stoned. We can walk out of here this morning. Or if you're online, wherever you're at, you can walk in that freedom today. And then Jesus says about sin, we don't have to live in it anymore. Go sin no more. You know, that's a commandment from him. Go sin no more. And just don't. Crucify the flesh. Make sure you're reading the word, spending time in fellowship, spending time in prayer. You know, the things that, you know, are ABCs of Christianity, that we're doing those things so that we're strong enough to walk in that victory. The problem is, is you know, we're not, we're not reading the word, we're not in fellowship, you know, those things. And we don't have victory in our lives, we wonder why. But we do those things he's given us to do, strengthen it. Still the temptation is coming, it still can be hard. But we all know that. But the victory is there. He enables us not to sin. When he says rejoice evermore, he enables us to do that. Well, how do you rejoice evermore? Well, you know what? You always have something to rejoice about. You're breathing. You're still going to heaven no matter what you're going through. Your sin is forgiven. He's building you a, some kind of a, a mansion or something up there, a house. You're, whatever you're going to want is going to be there. He enables us to do that. When he says, love your enemy, he enables you to do that. Oh, Pastor Jim, no, what do you mean? Love your enemy, the person, look what they did to me. They have to get me, they want to kill me. How do I love them? Well, you can begin by praying for them. Love is action, not feeling. You may not even like them, but you can pray for them. You can give them a cu cup of water. Watch what God does. Ann and I have seen it in our lives. We've had enemies that turned around and thought we were the greatest people in the world after a while. Hey, uh, it's amazing when that happens. Because we're not the greatest people in the world. But love your enemy. See, when the Lord speaks in, in His Word, there's power in His words. There's power in His speech. When He says, go sin no more, He means it. And He enables us to not sin anymore. So I believe like the Lord would say to us today, I don't condemn you. Maybe you're going through stuff right now. He says, I don't condemn you. Go your way and sin no more, is what he would say to you and I. And then, guess what? It's your choice and my choice to obey or not. Because we're not robots. It would be easier, wouldn't it? It just made us, but then we would be a robot. So it's up to us to choose that path in that direction. And you know what? When we do that, it's so much better. So much better. That's my experience anyhow. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that yes, you give us commandments. You give us things to do. But you don't give us anything to do that you don't enable us to do. You give us the strength and the power to overcome things in our lives. You give us the strength and the power to stand before people and proclaim your gospel when the time is right. You say go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. And we take those steps, Lord, and you give us the strength and the power and the tools that we need in this life. You've given us everything we need because you've given us yourself. We thank you for that so much.
in our hearts, Lord, this morning. I pray our hearts would be that our neighbors and our families and those we work with and those we play with and those we come across in the stores, Lord, in the post office or wherever we're at, they would see Jesus in us and come to know who you are. So they can be with us forever, Lord. We know that's your heart. And again, we say, Lord, use us. Use us. Thank you so much. Be glorified in these lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. A men tonight, 6.30. Women tomorrow is 10 o'clock. 6.30 Wednesday night. And 6.30 Friday night. So, God bless you. Walk with Jesus. Thank you.